Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for another wonderful Lord's Day. We thank you for opening our eyes this morning, putting breath in our lungs, dear Lord, and allowing us to be here to worship you. Dear Lord, at this time we ask prayers for those who are sick. Lord, we ask that you grant them the opportunity to be with us on the next appointed time, dear Lord. Also be with the doctors and medical, uh, medical personnel, dear Lord, that you can guide them so those that are sick and ill can be with us on the next appointed time. Dear Lord, we ask that we also give a prayer for those who have fallen away, dear Lord, and aren't with us, dear Lord. We ask, dear Lord, that their hearts can be pricked and they can come back to you before it's everlasting too late. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you continue to bestow upon this congregation, dear Lord. We ask, dear Lord, that you continue to keep your arms around us, dear Lord, and guide us, and that everything we do today in worship is according to your will. Dear Lord, please continue to be with us. In Jesus Christ's name I say this prayer. Amen. Let's sing song number 515. That was number 515. Next, let's sing song number 133. That was 133. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses.
Next, let's sing song number 356. 356, and during the song, we will prepare for communion. So We have now reached a portion of our service for which the Bible refers to as the Lord's Supper, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we learn from the example of the first century Christians that we are to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week as we are assembled within the worship assembly. In Acts chapter uh, 20, verse 7, the Bible states, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. For further instruction, we will refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. Here the Bible teaches us that we are to remember the suffering and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that he made that sacrifice on the cross of Calvary to give us all the opportunity for salvation. We also learn that we are to examine ourselves so that we can ensure that our worship here today is acceptable in the sight of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30, the Bible states, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for your love and your mercy that you have shown unto the world, that you have shown unto each and every one of us. Father, we are thankful for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he committed himself to thy will to do all of those things which you would have him to do. And that he did it freely and willingly because he loved us. He went to the cross for us. And he suffered and died that we might have hope. Father, let us always appreciate this tremendous sacrifice of our Lord. And at this time, as we partake of the bread which represents your son's body, we pray that we do this in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. We ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray and give thanks. Amen. We will now pray for the cup of the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee once again giving you thanks for your son and what his shed blood represents for each and every one of us. For we know that without the death of the tester and the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Father, we know that he shed his blood and purchased the church. And through those actions, we can be here today in this assembly. We can show our love and devotion, and we can give you thanks for all of those things which you do for us each and every day of our lives. Father, we know that through the shedding of his blood, we have the opportunity to exist within a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Father, we thank you for all of these things. And as we prepare to partake of the fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood, we pray that we do this in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. We ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray and give thanks. Amen.
Let's sing song number 97. That was 9 7. We'll sing the first, third, and fourth verses. And oh, God is so. We have now reached a portion of our service for which the Bible refers to as the collection for the saints. For scriptural reference, we will turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Here the Bible states, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. For further instruction, we will refer to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. And here the Bible states, But this I say, he was so sparingly, so reap also sparingly, and he was so bountifully, so reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Let us pray for the collection. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you provide. We thank you for providing us with this day, for allowing us to gather together within this assembly that we might do those things which are pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth at this time. Father, as we prepare our minds and our hearts to give, allow us to do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. Allow us to do this not with a grudging heart, but with the cheerful heart by which you have commanded. Father, help us to know that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive, as that is what our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us. Father, help us to give keeping your example in mind, that you freely gave your all when you sent your son to this earth to die on the cross for us. Father, help us to give our all. Help us to give as you have prospered us. And Father, we pray that what is giving will go to the upkeep of your kingdom for the necessity of the saints and for the, further, the furtherance of your ministry and the preaching of the gospel throughout the world. Father, we thank you and we ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray and give thanks. Amen.
As they finish the collection, if you would like to mark the song that will be after our lesson, that will be song number 559. That was 559. And the song before our lesson will be song number 391. 391, and if it's not a burden to you, let's stand as we sing. Please be seated. Today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 15, verses 24 through 30. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is the, your faith. Be is done for you as you desire. And her daughter's was held instantly. Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee and went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame and blind and the crippled, the mute, and many others, and they put them at his feet, and he nil healed them. That was Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Huh? Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 was the scripture reading, but we are going to focus this morning on Matthew chapter 13, 
verses 41. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Everything except God, heaven, hell, and the soul of man has an expiration date. Everything on this time side of life will expire. We can look on food containers and see when it expires. But when it comes to us, we don't know when that day is. It would do us well to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God before we expire. At the end of this parable, it speaks of the time when everything connected to it will expire. That means right now, while we are in the realm of time, we have opportunity to obey God because only God's children will be saved when time expires. Have you ever heard the saying, we are all God's children? Or in God's eyes, we are all the same. We are all brothers and sisters in God's eyes. Well, let's see if Jesus agrees with that. In this parable, Jesus is talking about two types of sowers, two types of sons, two types of people that will be gathered out, and two ways in which a person can choose to go. See, the two sons, uh, one is the children of the kingdom, and the other one is the children of the evil one. Look at chapter 13 starting at verse 20, uh, 37, and he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. So we got the sons of the kingdom, and we have the children of the evil one. We have two types of children here. And the enemy sold them is the devil. And he said, well, we're going to let the wheat and tares grow together. So the children of God sit here among those who are children of the evil one. Because the evil one planted them here. There's nothing wrong with the seed. The Bible said in Luke 8, 11, the seed is the word of God. There's nothing wrong with the seed. There's something wrong with the heart, see. The seed is good that Jesus sowed, but it is the soil that it falls on that makes it bad. Bible says, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of this age, and the Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom. Jesus is making a distinction here between the kingdom, the church, and the kingdom of God. Notice in that the kingdom of the Son exists prior to the separation of good and evil. In verse 41, in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Jesus is going to give the kingdom back to the Father. The kingdom of the Son is the church. The kingdom of the Father is the overall reign of God. So Matthew distinguishes between the kingdom of the Son 
and the kingdom of the Father. In Matthew 16, 28, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's the church. Matthew 20, 20, the Bible says the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with their sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit on one hand, one on the right, and one on the left. Jesus is distinguishing his kingdom, the church, from the kingdom of the Father, the kingdom of the Father. Matthew 25, 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 26, 29. But I say to you, I will not drink up this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So when Jesus says that he's coming, they will gather out of his kingdom all of those who are stumbling blocks and that are lawless. And if I am a stumbling block to one of my brothers or sisters, and I know I'm a stumbling block, if I don't change it, I'll be gathered out with the reapers. If I know that I am lawless and not living as God has called me to, I'll be gathered out with the reapers. Notice it says that until judgment comes, there will always be found those who pretend to be among the legitimate sons of the kingdom. The Bible says in that chapter, verse 47 through 50, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up out of the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them in the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just because someone makes a claim to be a child of God does not mean he is. He could be tares among the wheat. See, that's why they call them tares, see. They tear up relationships. They tear up the church. They're tares, see. They cause frustration to the children of the one that called them. You see, in the parable the landowner said, let them grow together. See, that Darnell, that wheat, he went and sold this bad seed among the good seed. But as they grow, they both look alike. They look the same. You can't tell them apart, but usually it is too late. The enemy had sold these tares. And this is an act that was then, and is still a common form in the Eastern uh, 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 culture, uh, uh, and they use it for malice and revenge. It is easily escape detection. You can't tell them apart until they reach the, uh, 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 the point of maturity. They look alike. So when you see the children of the evil one and the children of God, they look alike, dress alike, they talk alike. They act alike. But some of them are legit and some of them are counterfeit. But to know the difference between those that are legit and counterfeit, the word of God has the answer. Let us go to what Jesus is talking about. He will send forth his angel. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks. Now, 
this word a stumbling block. It means in the Hebrew, it is a rock rising up through the earth, which trips up the traveler. Hence of Jesus the Messiah to the Jews who refused him. Some person or thing which leads one to sin. I know growing up in the church, I've never seen so many Christians divided because of bad business practices. And they says, well, another Christian took advantage of me because they know that in the church the Bible says, oh, do not take another Christian to court. So they took advantage of me. See, these things is what tells us that in the kingdom, things like this do happen. What is he saying? That we ought to be on our guard. The definition means it is a stick bait, a snare, a stumbling block, an offense, a cause of stumbling, something that hinders you, an offense, something that I can do to cause you to stumble. If I'm envious of you, if I uh, don't like how you are, I may try to do something to cause you to stumble, to make you a spiritual wreck, to cause you to sin against the Lord. That's a hindrance. That's what the children of the evil one does because the evil one put them here. Anything I can do to cause you to stumble. When I get to the point to where I don't care about your salvation, that I want you to stumble and to lose your soul. How do I get to that point? I'm the child of the evil one. It also says that these stumbling blocks may cause a Christian to just fall away from the Lord. When something in the church has happened to them so bad, they cannot get up enough courage and strength uh, to get back in the fight. See, the Bible says, but a righteous man, he'll fall down seven times and what? He'll get back up. But sometimes the most cruelest thing, we may find some in the church that treat you worse than some in the world. You have to be careful because a stumbling block could cause you to do something to someone you shouldn't be doing. Oh, it has happened. So when Jesus is coming to get these stumbling blocks, listen, we can be a stumbling block to ourselves. Proverbs chapter 16, 18, the Bible said pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. We can stumble, be a stumbling block to ourselves, just careless as we want to be about our salvation. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled at the truth. They stumbled at Jesus, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. When someone is disobedient to the word, uh, I don't even know if they have any boundaries of how they'll treat others. But they are a stumbling block to themselves. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. Notice you can be a stumbling block to those who want to do God's will. 
Okay. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. It's how we become a stumbling block, putting our mind on the interest of man instead of God. Romans 14, 13, the Bible says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Jesus is coming to get those stumbling blocks out of his church. Matthew 18, 6, Jesus says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. Listen to the warning Jesus gives. It would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block come. Be careful if you're a stumbling block. Jesus says, woe to that man from whom the stumbling block. It's better that you had a millstone tied around your neck and you be thrown into the deepest part of the sea. If you think Jesus is lying, well then keep on being a stumbling block. Next, Jesus is talking about the lawless. This word, the lawless, means those who are lawless or who break the law. Those who disobey the commandment of honor thy father and mother or transgress the law of God. It is those uh, 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 who violate the civil law. This is also God's command. Those breaking it are lawless, which means they are called transgressors. Those who are unjust in their dealings are also lawless. For this reason, the hands of Pilate and those with him unjustly condemned Jesus are called wicked, unlawful men. King James calls it unlawful or wicked. The most notable example of lawlessness is the Antichrist, that wicked, lawless one we find in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. But these lawless men, Lawless people who are without law, who are unjust, who break the commands of God, who continuously do this. These are the ones that the word of God warns us about. Listen, Bible says in the book of Proverbs 4, 14 through 16, do not enter the path of the wicked. And do not proceed in the way of the evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it. Pass on. This is the punchline here. Verse 16. For they cannot sleep unless they do evil. Boy, that's, that's, that's a tough point to get to. I can't sleep till I've done something evil to you. Listen to what he says. They cannot sleep unless they do evil. And they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. 
I cannot sleep unless I harass you and cause havoc in your life. I'm saturated with wickedness. I can't sleep. Oh, I'm up thinking of ways to get over on you. I got to find a way. I got to get Brother Jarvey. Oh, I got to find a way to get that brother. I can't sleep till I get him. That's a whole nother level of wickedness. And when your conscience gets to that point, as, as, as Paul was talking about in 1 Timothy 4, Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils having their conscience seared. They're numb. They don't feel anything. They don't care about how much wickedness they do to you. Their conscience is numb. They get offended at the truth. Look at Job 21.7. Why do the wicked still live? Job said. Continue on. Also become very powerful. Their descendants are established with them in their sight. Their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. And the rod of God is not on them. Why they still live? They're wicked. You somebody brag about, oh, look at all this land I own. Doesn't matter. You're wicked. He says, why do the wicked live? Why do they continue on? Remember David in Psalm 73? He said he almost stumbled till he went into the house of the Lord. He couldn't understand how the wicked was prospering. How are they getting away? They, 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 uh, uh, they eat the best things. They don't obey you, Lord, but why do they have all of these things? He couldn't understand. Job says here, well, why do the wicked still live? I don't understand it. But I learned how to stay out of God's business, see. Verse 30 and 31, he says, for the wicked is reserved for the day of calamity. And God says, don't worry, they're, they're not going nowhere. They're going nowhere fast. I got the wicked, see. Whatever thing I've ever done to you or you've done to me and I thought I got away with it, oh no, payday is coming. We don't get away with nothing. We talk about this wickedness. It's all in the world. Wickedness. Why do the wicked still live? The enemy has put them there. We talk about how great of a country this is. It's not the country that's great. It's what God does in this country that makes it great. There's nothing great about sin. The Bible said that the devil is the god of this world. Yeah, he's running it. Look, this world, it's, it's, it's in shambles. It's full of hate, murder, scams. And every, they're racist in every race. You can't point out one group. There's races, there's Russian races, Portuguese, Hispanics, black. They're in every race. Hatred and racism runs rampant in this world. I'm not concerned about who doesn't like me because of how God made me. God don't make mistakes. I just play the game with the uniform I was issued. We need to learn that wickedness it's not something that we, 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 we want to be like. We want to love God and love each other. I love the brotherhood. I love my brothers and sisters. That's what we want to do. Listen to what Timothy says, realizing the fact, 1 Timothy 1.9, 1 
that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers and mothers. The law is for those that are lawless. But Jesus, oh, this is beautiful. Jesus has redeemed us from lawless deeds. Jesus has. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And to purify for himself a people. What kind of people are he looking for? For his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Oh, he's looking for people of every nation. Zealous of good works. Oh, John says, oh, we ought to lay down our life like the brethren. Boy, you ought to be comfortable and say, oh, I love my brothers like my next breath. Boy, can your love get that deep to love your brother like your next breath? Oh, zealous for good works, not wicked ones. Look at Hebrews 10, 17. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Don't, don't you, man, don't you want to just push all of that old wickedness behind you? God says, hey, get on up, son. Get on up, daughter. I'm going to dust you off. Now, baby, try it again. And I will remember no more. Romans 4, 7, blessed are those who lawless deeds have been forgiven. You, we are blessed. Our lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. All covered by the blood of Christ. Are you blessed today? Do you want to be zealous of good works? Do you want to be a stumbling block to your brothers? Do you want to be lawless toward your maker? You don't have to be. If you're a child of God and you may have called yourself being lawless or a stumbling block to another brother. Jesus said, except you re they repent, they shall all likewise perish. Repentance is necessary. And if you're not a child of God, you hear the gospel. If you believe it, repent, confess, and be baptized into the watery grave of baptism. Paul said in Acts 22 to 16, arise and be baptized and wash your sins away. The Lord waits patiently for you. Won't you come as together we stand and sing the song of invitation? Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him with all that I do. Yielding allegiance, flat-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing.
Please be seated. And now let's be led in a closing prayer. Let us pray together. Our Almighty Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for this opportunity that we've had to assemble together to worship you this morning. We pray that our worship was both in spirit and in truth, and everything we did was pleasing unto you. We're thankful that we had the opportunity this morning to come to you in prayer. We're thankful that we had the opportunity to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, giving praise to you in song. We're thankful that we had the opportunity to commune with Christ and partake of the Lord's Supper. We're thankful that you have blessed us enough that we have something to give and that we were able to give to you. And we're thankful, Father, for the word of God which was preached to us this morning. We pray that each of us might be of an encouragement one to another and that we're never stumbling blocks to our fellow Christians, that we might work together for good and that we might encourage one another into love and good works. We pray that you be with each of us as we leave here. We pray that as we leave after Bible class, that we go into the community as bright shining lights and that we'll return again here tonight to once again worship you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.